Transitional Justice uh, here on a given Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we have um, we have a report of uh, news uh, that is very important and very current. And it is the coup in Khartoum, the coup uh, in Sudan, where the military took over the government. Um, this is very important, especially in view of the fact that we've been talking about Sudan and the possibility of a coup and and the possibility of uh, rotating the government between. Um, the military and the civilian representative government in, in Sudan with Mutasim Ali. Mutasim is, uh, is Sudanese. He's here in the United States right now, um, but he is following this. And he tells me that with the news in Khartoum, he hasn't slept all night. So Mutasim, um, what is going on there? What is going on? Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for having me on the show. And I think this is a very you know critical moment in Sudan's uh, history. Um, just uh, last night, actually early this morning, um, the military uh, leaders um, sort of began arresting the civilian leaders and taking over the power um, in a very uh, unfortunate setback to Sudan's revolution. And at this point, Prime Minister um, Dr. Abdullah Hamdok is taken to an unknown um, place. Uh, many other ministers were detained and um, protesters were shot. There were three protesters, at least at this point, were killed and um, more than 140 people injured. And at this point, thousands of Sudanese are on the streets protesting to protect their revolution. Wow. Well, you know, we talked about this possibility the last time we were on the show, and I, I was fascinated. I told you I was fascinated with the notion that there would be an agreement by which the power in the government rotated between the military and the civilian. But in our discussion with Tassim, um, it came clear that when you, when you do that and you give the power initially to the military, they will take every opportunity to undermine the civilian government so that when the civilian government is supposed to, you know, take its turn in the rotation, it won't be able to do that. And gee whiz, that's exactly what, what has happened here, hasn't it? Absolutely. This is uh, uh, for many uh, observers who uh, continue to follow the situation in Sudan. Uh, this move from the military is very much expected. They have planned for it. And from the very beginning, they did not seem interested in transferring power to civilians. There are many reasons to, uh, as to why they were, you know, they were not prepared to hand out, uh, hand over power to civilians. Uh, number one, most of them, and I was speaking of the head of the um, military council, and in addition to the to his deputy, who is the commander of militia a militia named Janjaweed that is involved in serious human rights violations in Darfur particularly, but definitely also in other areas in Sudan. And so they are uh, somehow, you know, either perpetrators or complicit with, um, you know, with human rights, um, you know, serious human rights violations in Sudan. Um, most recently, uh, you know, I don't know if we spoke last time about uh, a massacre in capital Khartoum that was in uh, June 3rd, 2019, where hundreds of protesters were killed and dumped into River Nile. Um, others were uh, detained, raped, kidnapping, right? And those uh, that atrocity and, and the massacre was committed by the same individuals that now, you know, uh, conducted the coup. And so, they, they, they fear accountability, they fear, um, you know, uh, prosecution, you know, if the power is transferred to the civilian leaders. And so they would do everything, everything in their power to undermine any democratic transition in Sudan. And it sounds like they'll do anything in their power to stay in power. Um, arresting the, and making them disappear, the members of the civilian government, the prime minister, um, that's going to be hard to fix. 
And I'm sure that the civilian government is right now, it's in, you know, it's in disarray. It's not like you could snap your fingers and they would come back uh, and, and provide uh, management of the country. They, they have been um, torn up here uh, in this coup. So um, why, why do these military people, why do they want to do this? What motivates them? Um, what, what's in it for them? And why don't they recognize the, the need um, to serve the people of Sudan? So, uh, it, it, you know, interestingly enough, the military leaders right now argue that the coup is actually they do not call this as a coup. They call this as, you know, turning, given the, uh, you know, uh, achieving Sudanese people's interest. They continue to claim that the Sudan, uh, Sudanese revolution was hijacked by a few political parties and it is. Uh, uh, the military's role to take that, uh, you know, to take the, the, the power back to the Sudanese people. So basically they do not call this as a revolution. Uh, again, as I said earlier, that they planned for this for months by creating events such as uh, in Eastern Sudan, by creating some security issues, whether that be in Khartoum or other prefer, uh, in, in peripheries. And the point was to say that the civilian um, government was unable to, number one, ensure that, uh, oh, achieve Sudanese people's interest, providing basic needs, food, fuel, um, you, know, um, you know, lower the inflation and so on. And so they sort of, you know, created a situation where they can, now they explain that the civilian government failed to deliver and it is the military's responsibility to take over at this point. And so what they're trying to do now is to, um, number one, declare the state of, uh, state of emergency. Number two, um, they dissolve the cabinet. Basically, we have no civilian government. And three, they, uh, they are going to uh, establish a constitutional court in the next couple of uh, weeks, as they said, they are going to establish a legislature also again in the next couple of weeks. And the idea is to undermine the civilian leadership. So basically they will pick people that uh, are, are, you know, sort of subject to their um, decision. They're bound by what the military will have to say. Uh, and so basically it's, um, it's a military coup in the making. Um, and so this is really very unfortunate, but again, to your question as to why are they doing this? What really in, incentivized them uh, to take such a you know cruel um, and a cruel step? And I think the main goal is to avoid accountability. These guys involved in serious uh, crimes, serious crimes, and some crimes amount to um, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, this is in Darfur. In South Kudrufan and Brunei, the two areas as we speak about all the time, and even in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, and so they they fear accountability, and that's why they the only way to to protect themselves is to remain in power, and they can do everything possible to remain in power. Well, they have the guns. I mean, it's not like anyone else has the guns. They, you know, when you. When you have, a, say, a protest, uh, and I read this morning in the Washington Post that in the protest, they just shoot people. And th then the protest can't be sustained that way because people are getting shot uh, at the protest. So if you have the guns, you can control the streets. It doesn't take long. Uh, and I guess that's what they're doing. Right. So so they, they have uh, guns. They have uh, money. And yes, they are brutal, they are ruthless, and they are committing really, they're killing protesters, right? Um, and, and, and so they would definitely continue to use, um, you know, force to oppress people. But again, the Sudanese people demonstrated that they would not accept military rule whatsoever. And they are going to utilize every peaceful measure to um, end the military rule. They have been successful to remove 
one of the long, uh, Af Africa's longest dictators, former president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, and they believe that they can also remove the, the junta uh, in Sudan today. And that's why they're on the streets, they're facing live ammunitions, right? They are being killed on a daily basis, they're being injured, they're being attacked and detained, but they are determined to continue protesting in a peaceful manner uh, to uh, reclaim the civilian leadership. Mm. Um, so Bashir, um, now Bashir uh, has been charged with atrocities and war crimes. He was in fact removed, but he has a, a relationship, if you will, um, with, with the, the junta right now. Um, and they have in fact protected him, haven't they? So what, what, is the, what is the interplay between Bashir and this military government? So um, some people suggest that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the junta, as uh, they're, they're acting to protect Bashir and the elements of the former regime. In fact, they are, you know, they were part of the, uh, the, the Bashir regime. They were part of the Bashir regime. And so um, somehow they are protecting Bashir. And so Bashir now for more than two years in the custody in, uh, of the Sudanese government, yet he is not being tried for the uh, atrocities that he committed. He's not being extradited to the ICC and the military guys are not even prepared and interested to extradite Bashir to the ICC. And so sort of shielding Bashir from, um, you know, from, uh, prosecution. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, because they, they, the same uh, military leaders uh, removed Bashir uh, from power, this is somehow a coup again. And so, um, you know, the, the, as much as they would like to, you know, to protect Bashir and, and prevent him from being threatened to the ICC, um, if Bashir is back to power, the first people to be, um, you know, in danger are these military uh, leaders. And so they are not really sure about what they are doing. They, they are, this is like a suicidal, as some ex, uh, experts suggest, this is a suicidal, um, you know, step that they, they have taken. And uh, they, would have to pay, uh, they would have to pay a price sooner or later. But, but it might be later because their principal objective right now is to stay in power for as long as they possibly can. Yeah. Right. So, so I think this might take some time. And, um, and yes, I would have to agree with you that um, I'm not sure if um, they are prepared to, you know, to give up the power at this point. Um, but certainly the, uh, the, the Sudanese people are determined that they will not be back to their homes until they, you know, they completely claim a civilian leadership, and there will be no power sharing between the military and civilian leaders. And this yeah, is that would be a better mistake. idea, wouldn't it? We we have found that rotating between civilian and military wasn't going to work, and hasn't worked, and won't work, and so you have to have the civilian government to supervise the military. The military must respond. Um, and, um, you know, the military must be subordinate to the civilian government. But it sounds like that's a long way from here. Absolutely. This is a very long uh, way to go. And I think when I mentioned that this is, you know, the coup that we have today was um, sort of, you know, uh, was expected. Uh, and and th the reason why, you know, people like myself and other experts say, this is an expected step. It was because of the power sharing deal, right? Um, you know, the mistake from the very beginning was to make a power deal, uh, power sharing deal with the military um, guys, people who were, uh, you know, perpetrators of serious human rights violations. Um, and I think as much as terrible and heartbreaking to see uh the 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 military taking uh, take, uh taking over the power uh, i think this could be an opportunity for sudanese people to come together to unite and make sure that there will be no more um power share 
deal between the military and civilian leaders. There, there is only one way, and that is a complete and total civilian leadership and military must be subject to civilian orders. Mm -hmm. So um, how many people live in Khartoum? What's the population of Khartoum? Um, you, you know, some of the data say that there are more than 12 million people in Khartoum. Um, and of course, you know, uh, people can, you know, continue to come back and forth from, from and to, to, the, uh, to Khartoum because Khartoum is a capital city. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, the rally of the people in Khartoum would make a difference. People can protest and rally in other states in peripheries. Um, you, it, it is important to do so, but I think it is powerful and game changing when they do so in Khartoum. Well, so what about the whole of Sudan? How many people live in, what's the population of Sudan as a whole? I think the latest um, uh, data were from uh, 1987, uh, and um, and before the referendum, before the separation of the of South Sudan, uh, you know they said it were about 49 million people, and today, uh, you know, even though there's you know no accurate data, but uh, people say that there are about 30. Um, 38, 39 million people in Sudan today. Mm. Well, is, is there an organized group, a, a political party, a front, uh, some organization uh, among the civilians, you know, among the people who, um, who can speak for the people, who can countervail on the military um, who, who have taken control? So, um, you know, they, they used to be, a unified um, civilian leadership that you know uh, would lead protests and uh, direct S Sudanese people. Uh, today, things are a little blurry. Uh, people, you know, um, there are some some of the committees in the neighborhoods, which is a very good thing. We call them resistance committee. They are very well organized in terms of you know from from the bottom up. But then there is no unified uh, leadership on the top. But from the neighborhoods and uh, villages and um, small cities and all of that, there are very organized, um, you know, committees uh, that are able to rally and you know um, and protest and coordinate very very well. Uh, but there is lack of unified leadership um, across the country that will you know, kind of sponsor, and uh, if in case there is a negotiation to transform power, that would be one of the issues that the Sudanese people have to deal with. Yeah. But I think this is something that in the making, I think the people learn from the past. Uh, and I think this is something that people are working on right now. Good. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, in fact, it has a, a certain amount of uh, international uh, notoriety because of the power sharing agreement in the first place. And then this uh, very significant coup in the second place. And so it's not happening in a vacuum. And you have the, the countries around, uh, the countries uh, maybe not so close, but interested in what happens in Sudan. And, and you have the international community. And they are reacting. Some are taking more affirmative steps than that. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about um, how that is happening. This is the same day. This all happened today. Uh, sure. What kind of reaction from the neighbors? What kind of reaction from the friends, the enemies of Sudan? Uh, right. What kind of reaction from the global powers? Uh, so far, uh, there is really very encouraging international support to the democratic transition. And there is uh, a unifying message, primarily from the United Nations, from the United States of America, United Kingdom, Germany, Norway, France, and many other European countries that they support the transitional government and they urge the military to uh, back off and Im to immediately release prime minister and other um, political uh, detainees. Uh, I think that that's a very strong and good message. And in fact, America just, um, uh, you know, sort of, um, they express concern over the situation and that they will withhold 
if the military, of course, did not release the prime minister and the other ministers, they would withhold the $700 million that were initially uh, approved by the um, by Congress to support the democratic transition in Sudan. This is very encouraging uh, support, and I think there's need uh, there's more need to be done. Uh, in terms of regional uh, organizations, the African Union uh, actually called for um, emergency meeting, and uh, they are uh, more likely to suspend Sudan's membership to the African Union. This is a very good step again. Um, um, Ethiopia, on the other hand, our neighbor from the Eastern part, um, also expressed concern about, uh, over the situation and supported the democratic transition in Sudan. Uh, whereas we haven't heard from uh, Saudi Arabia, we haven't heard from United Arab Emirates, and we haven't heard from Israel yet, uh, the country that Sudan uh, you know, began to normalize with. And this, will, uh, this raises a lot of concern that they may uh, sort of support the, uh, the military um, guys to run the country. Uh, this is, uh, you, know, you know, again, is yet to be confirmed, but again, uh, I think uh, this is a little more than a day now uh, and no condemnation from any of them. I think that's uh, very concerning. Mm. So whether they support or, um, you know, the civilian government or, um, or don't, um, and whether the United States turns over that $700 million or doesn't, um, does that have any profound effect um, on, on the, the power that the military has taken? I mean, for example, if, they, if the United States didn't give them the $700 million, would, would that change things dramatically if they did or didn't do that? As you mentioned earlier, the military has its own resources um, and it may not be all that important whether it gets the 700 million or not. Yeah. Uh, will it be? You're totally right. From the past experiences, I'm speaking of from the period of the former regime of Omar al Bashir. I, you know, I hate to say this, but I do not think that um, withholding uh, aids or funds to Sudan will change any, anything on the ground. It will just make it harder for the Sudanese people. Right, uh, because in the end, as I said, the military has its resources, and and they they have their international relations. Um, I do not want to mention or name countries, but they they have relationships. Uh, they export gold. They export um, you know oil and other um, you know other more resources and all of that. And so I think there are, there there. Are, uh, you know, the, the, first, the Sudanese people would definitely be affected by this. Uh, but again, I think it is an important, an important move. I think it is a strong message to send. Uh, the Sudanese people are uh, suffering anyway. And I think Sudanese people may not object to this move by, you know, withholding funds to Sudan at this point. I think that fund were, were, you know, was meant to support the democratic transition. But if we have the coup right now, then there is no point of uh, transferring funds because there's no democratic transition anyway. Um, we, we have the experience of the former Bashir, as I said, you know, they've been sanctions, sanctioned and they've been cut off from the, you know, from the world. And yet he was able to, Bashir was able to be in power for nearly 30 years. And so uh, I do not think that this will make a big of a change, but I think it's strong message to send to the military guys that uh, there is like, a need for democratic transition. Oh, yeah. But um, nobody has said they were going to take affirmative action. Uh, nobody has said they were going to send troops in, for example. Nobody has said they were going to arm uh, the civilians uh, to effectively conduct a revolution against the military. Um, has, has anybody stepped in to actively mm, support uh, the civilians and, and the people of Sudan in this, or are they letting it happen as it will? Um, uh, nobody actively moved to support the civilians in their struggle. And I do not think that that, that is also something that is likely to happen. And um, I also believe that the Sudanese people may not want to see that. 
because they believe that the only way to defeat um, the junta is through peaceful protest. Uh, they were able to do that uh, with the Bashir, and they are sure that they can do this with the military because these guys are powerful. They have money. They have, uh, you know, they have guns, and so you cannot defeat them by uh, guns and and you know and all of that. And so the only way to defeat them is to continue peaceful protests. That's the strongest way to defeat them. Now the you know the um, labor associations, uh, organizations, civil um, uh, you know groups and and civil society organizations call for civil disobedience across the country. I think that would be an effective tool to um, you know to make it difficult for the military to run the country, and hopefully that will bring them to an end. You know, um, in, in that part of uh, Africa, there's always a possibility that terrorist organizations will see this as opportunistic. Is, is that possible? Do you think that um, terror organizations will, will see this as an opportunity and expand their presence in Sudan? The answer is definitely yes. As we know, terror organizations always tend to invest in fragile political and security situations. And I think the, the situation in Sudan is very encouraging um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and very inviting, right? Um, but I think if that happens, that will not only be a threat to uh, Sudanese people themselves uh, alone, but also the international community. And uh, it would definitely be a threat to the junta. Uh, and so uh, it is a you know alarming situation. People will have to watch that closely. Uh, but hopefully, the people uh, of Sudan uh, will be able to reclaim the civilian leadership before everything you know sort of uh, uh, you know uh, everything turns to um, unknown. Yeah. So um, you know, what do you think? that the, we call it the European powers and the United States, all the big international powers ought to do here. I mean, there, you mentioned sanctions. I'd be interested in knowing what sort of sanctions you feel would be appropriate. What kind of action would be appropriate in order to um, recreate a civilian government here? First and foremost, they need to be a support to uh, to uh, human rights defenders to the Sudanese people who are protesting. The Sudanese people need basic things like uh, SIM cards, right? Like, um, you know, uh, medicines or, you know, basic things to, you know, to continue, you know, civil uh, uprising, right? This is like a peaceful, these are peaceful for, uh, protests. And, and so these are really simple things to, uh, to provide. This is number one. Number two, I think uh, for the international community to sanction, right, um, all the members of the uh, military uh, government right now, including the, um, the head of the military council, deputy, and all the members of the council, they need to be sanctioned individually. And I think that will limit their movement. That will um, sort of, uh, you know, put them under pressure. Um, of course, coupled with the civil unrest, I think that will likely end to, um, you know, handing over the power uh, to the civilians. Uh, in addition, I think, um, um, you know, um, the moves like uh, withholding aids to Sudan at this point, it, it sends a strong message to the leaders of the junta um, from withholding aids from, them, from America, uh, should be from World Bank as well. Uh, I think that would be very uh, encouraging. And I think the regional organization like African Union should use all the diplomatic pressure to pressure the junta to release prime minister, other ministers, and hand, immediately hand over the power to civilians. So the, the pressure would be all, all of these uh, organizations, countries, and, and the like, would be putting pressure on the on the military in Sudan to step down and turn the power over to a civilian government. 
and be out of the picture or at least be subject to that civilian government that's what everybody would be asking yeah absolutely so this would be uh the the main demand and uh as if you remember last time we spoke about uh, you know of course handing over power to the civilians is a very important step but i think the most important thing is to restructure the military institution so that the military will no longer um you know sort of lead a military coup there should be no military coups in sudan uh once and for all and that can only happen through restructuring the military institution uh and so it is important to hand number one to hand uh, over power to civilians but I think it is even more crucial to, um, you know, to restructure the military institution. Yeah. <clears throat> so what what do you uh, what do you think is going to happen here? Um, don't be pessimistic. Don't be optimistic. Be realistic, Mutasim. Uh, what do you think? How this is going to unfold? We're here on day one. Uh, things are still, you know, happening. I'm sure the media, as in the rest of the world, the media in Sudan is covering this uh, to the extent they're not they're not being censored by the military. Um, and we don't know what will happen. But do you do you have any ideas about how it will unfold unfold? Unfortunately, I will have to be uh, pessimistic and optimistic at the same time. Pessimistic in a sense that, uh, uh, you know, I fear that more, um, you know, people will be killed, protesters will be, you know, killed. And I think we began to see that already from, from, from today, uh, that will continue as people will continue to protest. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the pessimistic um, side of it. I think the optimistic of it uh, is, is that the civilians will not back off. They will continue to peacefully protest. The Sudanese people are very creative in terms of the ways of protesting. I think, you know, revolution became part of their, uh, you know, daily life it is, you know, reflected in, uh, in music, reflected in anything, in any part of their life. And so, and so I think that's very encouraging. And uh, the determination in the face of, you know, brutal uh, militia in the army, I think uh, that's incredible. It's something to celebrate. And I have no doubt that, uh, you know, they will be able to, uh, to claim victory. Uh, claiming victory meaning they would claim the civilian leadership total civilian leadership and would begin the democratic transition one last question which i said we're almost out of time and and that is this again nothing happens in a vacuum here uh you mentioned that um you know what we have right now is is a fragile arrangement a, a fragile situation and it was fragile before too when they made that agreement um but everybody is watching uh, everybody in the rest of Africa is watching, for example, and there are other fragile governments elsewhere in Africa. So my question to you is, how does this affect them? How does this affect other countries uh, who, who may have the possibility of the same kind of military coup going forward? What does this do for, for all of Africa as, 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 a, as a group of nations that are watching every member of Africa? Right, this is a very good question. Uh, there are a couple of things. Number one is that uh, it is, uh, you know, for sure for many African countries who are watching what is happening in Sudan today would be very discouraged, right? And Sudanese people bravely fought for a civilian leadership and they were nearly successful. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, when the time sort of, you know, um, came to hand over power to civilians, the military guys sort of, uh, you know, uh, took over the power. And I think this is very discouraging for many people who aspire for democracy, for freedom, and uh, for peace. Uh, this is what, on the other hand, um, you know, I think uh, the people of Africa should be inspired by the determination of the Sudanese people. The Sudanese people, as much as frustrated about the takeover of power by the military, but they are determined that this is what this was expected, and they are willing to fight to a nail that uh, until they claim uh, their civilian leadership, until um, you know they achieve their goal, freedom, justice, and peace. This is what they call for, and they continue to protest in the again in the face of you know brutal, brutal militia and 
military. And so I think that should be inspiring. And I have no doubt that the Sudanese people will win this battle. Yes, and it goes beyond uh, Sudan. It's uh, symbolic. And uh, of course, uh, we're watching it. You're watching it very intensely to the point of um, you know being riveted to it as, as a Sudan person, a Sudanese person. But the whole world is watching and um, it will have an effect on all of us somehow. So uh, we'd like to talk to you again about it, Mutasim. Thank you very much for reporting to us today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Aloha. Thank you.